welcome here uh, Sean and also Moni and Magdalena, who will be co-presenting with him. Uh, Sean's a real pioneer. Um, you know, first he was an accidental pioneer. He, he kind of like went into his own altered states, which was seen by psychiatry as, you know, bipolar psychosis. But they, he didn't quite buy that because it seemed more to him like, like part of a breakthrough or a spiritual awakening. So he followed up on that by starting to look into it and communicate with others about his vision through uh, a, um, a, a number of videos, bipolar or waking up, and then also a book. And then he also started looking into how he could help others who have had these experiences maybe continue to follow through and explore and do the healing work they needed to do after uh, just kind of falling into these altered states. So he's going to be talking about that a lot more today. And so maybe without further ado, I'd just like to turn it over to Sean. Okay. And, and just so the participants know, I have uh, two of my clients have been happy to join us here. Uh, Moni Kettler and Magdalena, they were my first two clients uh, on a healing program that I'm going to be talking about, okay? So we'll get to their stories a little later in the presentation. So we'll just start. All right. So a little bit about my background, just real quick. And, you know, the details of my background, you can read about in the book that Ron talked about. In 1996, I was arrested and sent to a psychiatric hospital in Toronto. I, basically, I thought I died and was being taken to heaven. But when I was there, I rejected the diagnosis they were giving me of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. And the reason was, you know, I was sure I was having a spiritual awakening of some kind. I had a feeling of oneness with the universe, powerful energetic sensations in my body, heightened sense of vision, taste, smell, touch, hearing, overwhelming feeling that I knew all I needed to know. And I also felt that I was being tested by God. So for me, this was a spiritual thing. I thought the doctors were making a big mistake, right? Um, I was lucky, really lucky, because I was able to get out of the hospital within four days, got my act together, realized that things were not as they appeared. And, um, but while that hospitalization was very difficult, you know, I was handcuffed to a bed, I was forcibly injected. Um, it was an experience that I felt was very beneficial to me Years, I'd been dealing with years of on again, off again depression in my 20s that really came to an end after this, you know, spiritual experience. Now, <clears throat> about a year after that happened, I found the work of Dr. Stan Groff, who is a founder of what they call transpersonal psychology. And he described my experience as a spiritual emergency which is basically a difficult spiritual breakthrough which can actually be sort of beneficial, all right? And one of the benefits that I had had from my own spiritual emergency, and you could read about this in one of Groff's books, The Stormy Search for the Self, I can talk about that a little later, but um, one benefit was that I became less rational and much more intuitive. And part of my own intuition um, I had a dream, a very strong dream, where I was supposed to go to uh, Peru. And a year later, I just went. I just went to Peru, went to Machu Picchu, uh, was on a tour, and I was asking the shamans I was meeting there, you know, why am I here? And uh, they didn't really know, or they didn't give me any indication, but I did meet a woman there that was born on the same day as me, and she became my wife, this is Leisha Splendori. Uh, March 27th is our birthday, it's coming up. And we met in Peru, and eventually we moved to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, from here? Yeah, to Sao Paulo, city of 20 million people. And it took a while. I mean, this didn't, this didn't happen overnight, but my life changed radically. I left my career in advertising. I went to Sao Paulo. I became an English teacher. And that was all in my 30s, okay? Uh, my late 30s. But in Sao Paulo, um, in 2007, we had some similar experiences were happening with our nieces. Uh, two nieces, actually. I don't have time to get into that story. It's in the book. But um, at that time with my wife, who was also a psychologist by, by education, uh, we're both English teachers at the time, but she had been a psychologist previously. And we started to study the relationship between the spiritual emergency that I had and bipolar disorder. And that really started in 2007. And Part of that research was I had this YouTube channel, Bipolar Waking Up, where I started to speak with thousands of people online who had had spiritual experiences and received a psychiatric diagnosis. Um, my first video, back when I had more hair, 
am I bipolar or waking up was my big question. And that's where I really started to hear people talking about, yeah, I've been medicated for life and I had all kinds of spiritual experiences just like you did. So that, that was something. And we actually started working with people back then. And one of the things we were doing, we really started a research process. And we began to compare the experiences of people online with the theories of some pioneering psychologists and psychiatrists, Dr. Stan Groff, Dr. David Lukoff, who talked a lot about spiritual emergency, Artie Lang from the 1960s in England, okay? And also, you know, Dr. Lauren Mosher, who had formed the Soteria House movement. I'm sure there'll be many people on this call who are familiar with that. And Dr. John Weir Perry, who wrote the book Trials of a Visionary Mind, he also had a clinic like Mosher and like Artie Lang where they believed that going into psychosis was an attempted reorganization of the psyche and that instead of medicating these processes, we should help support people go through these processes, okay? So that's where they were coming from and that's where really I started and we actually did start working with people in psychosis at that time, my family members to be specific. Okay, out of all that research, I made a lot of videos, okay? A lot of YouTube videos. Um, over 60 slideshow videos in English with over 3 million views, translated into six languages, German, Romanian, Czech, Portuguese, French, and Spanish, right? And, uh, you know, even a, a one conference was created out of my work online. I had some people in the Netherlands. They heard I was coming to Europe, and they started to create a conference really um, because I introduced them to each other. They all said, Sean, do you want to do a seminar in the Netherlands? And I said, well, why don't you guys get together and see what you do? And they, they came up with this Crazy Wise conference. And, of course, we named it after Phil Borges' movie, Crazy Wise. And he's been a speaker at that conference three years. But that conference really started with my work and me introducing these people to each other. And um, that was really about, you know, looking at psychiatry differently. One of the bigger conferences uh, online, too, in 2015 was the Shades of Awakening conference, which was created by Dabney Alex. And that was an online conference where she was really focused on this relationship between spirituality and mental disorders and the potential for healing. Because she'd been through something like I'd been through. Uh, some of the other speakers on that conference, Paris Williams, you might see a little picture of him in the middle. He's the author of Rethinking Madness, very frequent contributor to Madden America, www.maddenamerica.com, and a host of others. I don't really have time to get into it, but... It was funny because I'd pretty much met every speaker, almost every speaker, before the conference had even begun, you know, because each of these people was really taking an initiative regarding the spiritual dimension of mental disorders or the healing potential of shamanism, something like that, okay? Uh, and then last year, Katie Motrin, who was part of the uh, International Spiritual Emergency Network, created an Emerging Proud conference where the mandate of that conference was really, hey, it's time to get out of the closet and um, <clears throat> start to speak about the spiritual experiences that we're having that are being labeled as uh, mental disorders, you know. You can see David Lukoff is right down in the middle there. That's a little photo of him there. Um, okay. So from these conferences and from a lot of the research, you know, we, we learned that it really it was essential to raise awareness and bring other options to deal with so-called mental disorders. It's really time for a change. We've got to do something different. Um, we needed a fresh approach. And uh, it took us a long time to get there because our first approach, our fresh approach, was not so fresh. We started with the old approach. <laughs> Soteria House and um, Diabasis and Artie Lang's clinics, they had all been, you know, happening in the late 19, or the 1970s, the early 1980s, and obviously they had some success, right? But for us, this model, like for my wife and I, this model, it, it didn't work. It just wasn't working. And there was a few reasons that we discovered in a very painful learning process, okay? Um, you know, those clinics were really designed for people that are in their first break of psychosis. That's what it was there for. You come to them immediately. But we didn't have access because we didn't have a clinic. We didn't have or a reputation at all or even credentials. Um, my wife was a psychologist, but I had no credentials. <clears throat> we, had very, we had no access to people at first break, very limited access. Um, and also, when we tried to work with people and, and tell the families and that, no medications, please wait for the medications and just support people when we had the chance, 
It really alienated friends and family members and doctors, this anti-medications approach. Um, we had no access to public funding like the Soteria models did. Uh, and also, psychosis has its own schedule. And so that meant if we got a call from somebody who was working through something, we had to drop everything, cancel my English classes and go find a place to work with them in the countryside. It was really chaotic to try and work with people whenever a psychosis struck. And then afterwards, without family support, it was really difficult for people to integrate because the families often were just pushing people to go back to the psychiatrist and not giving them any space you know, um, that they needed to sort of process what we took them through. You know. So we were having some success, but without all this other stuff, it was really difficult. Um, and, you know, similar to the Soteria House that happened in Alaska, the Soteria Alaska had only open for five years when they lost their funding. And there was even a clinic by Stan Groff, you know, who was the guy I was following, this, you know, pioneering psychiatrist, founder of transpersonal psychology. And the clinic that he was sort of supporting, uh, the Spires Creek Clinic, they went bankrupt after six months. And I was like, well, this can't happen. I need something that's sustainable, you know. So we realized that what we needed when we worked with somebody, we needed a program that was effective with people who had had multiple episodes of mania and psychosis because we simply were not going to get access to people before their first break, which was when Soteria was effective. We needed something that was funded by the client, so it needed to be fairly cheap, and it couldn't involve any overhead costs for us personally. We couldn't be afford to, to put out money to open a house, something like that. We needed a planned therapeutic strategy of daily healing activities. You know, some clinics are like, well, they just have a space for people to have space and, and maybe do some art therapy. That wasn't enough. I needed something more intensive. We needed an approach that would receive emotional and financial support from the family. They had to be involved. And the support for, or someone related to the family, like close to the family. And then we needed support for the client uh, before, during, and after the healing program from someone who was close to them, somebody who was really you know, within their physical range, because I live in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and some of this work would involve travel, okay? Um, so that's what we needed, and we started to work towards that direction. And part of that direction meant uh, a whole new approach, which was really taking what I felt were the important truths or the benefits of psychiatry, psychology, spirituality, and the peer support movement that we've seen grow so much, especially in the United States. Uh, a little bit in Europe, too, from what I understand. But in the U.S., it's, especially in Vermont, it's, it's really taken on a, a big, big hold, you know. So, and we felt that there were important truths from all of these areas. And so from psychiatry, we started to work with people while they were medicated. And that if, if there was improvement in our program, medication could happen afterwards under psychiatric supervision. You know, because they would be better. Um, from transpersonal psychology, a theoretical understanding of these spiritual experiences, what they call transpersonal experiences, transpersonal meaning go, being uh, going beyond the personal ego, you know, of seeing myself as a separate self. Transpersonal experience usually has an expansive experience or expansive quality to it, going beyond the personal. So... Those were the gifts from psychiatry and psychology. From the peer support movement, we recognize that in order to help people heal, you have to have a genuine connection between equals. It's not a hierarchical patient-client or client-doctor-patient -pa relationship where the doctor's here and the client's here. When we work with people, it's like, hey, I was in the hospital too. You know, the only difference between me and you is I work my, through more of my process than you have, and that's it. You know? And then from spirituality, uh, deeply shamanic healing techniques that can access our spiritual dimension. You know, you might call that spiritual dimension, dimension the other side. Stan Groff calls it the holotropic mind, all right? So we needed techniques. It wasn't just enough to just stay with people. There, there had to be some, something else. So that was our approach. And we had an assumption. And this came more from British researchers, Dr. John Reed and Richard Bentall. Uh, John Reed might be from New Zealand, um, which was that underlying all of these, these mental disorders, you know, a big part of it is trauma. And that to heal a disorder, the underlying trauma needs to be released. 
This isn't to say there isn't some genetic component. Maybe there is a small genetic propensity here or there. But, before, you know, you got to deal with that trauma before anything else. And that's not being dealt with. All right? But, okay, what is trauma? Well, trauma is not something bad that happens to you. It's the emotional dimension of an experience which has not been expressed. So, you know, a great example is like if a woman, uh, imagine a woman seeing her husband suddenly die and she doesn't feel anything. She doesn't even cry. And then later she's like, why didn't I cry when he died? It's because it was a traumatizing experience. She's cut herself off from that emotion, you know, and, and it has numbed and never gets past it. You know, trauma is the emotional dimension that it gets buried in the subconscious, you know, and, and we don't feel it. Okay. But, you know, a question that's rarely asked is, well, if it gets buried, where is this trauma? Because we don't see it. I mean, where, where, where do you find trauma? It can't be found on any uh, x-ray or MRI or anything like that. To understand what, where the trauma is, we realize, you know, a new paradigm paradigm is needed because the medical model sees you like this. You're basically meat, right? Your meat, your muscle, your neurons, your chemicals, and that's it. The transpersonal model is more like this. It's like, yes, you have a physical body, obviously, but there's also this greater biogenetic, bioenergetic component that's being completely ignored. Some people might refer to it as the chakra system. You could call it a soul maybe an etheric body, a subtle body. And, you know, this painting here from Alex Gray is uh, it's an analogy. It's not a scientific model. This is basically what we think is going on because it can't be measured by science. So we're just assuming it's there based on the experiences of many people, including myself and Alex Gray. Okay. So this is the model we're working with, that we've got this bioenergetic system. So the transpersonal vision is that the trauma is not necessarily in the brain, but in the physical body or brain, but or or in the physical body, but in the bioenergetic system. It could be anywhere in this system. Okay? Um, and to access the system, a safe, emotionally supportive set and setting is necessary. Okay, so you need to have a private space, and you need people involved who really get it, really get what's going on, and you need to keep away people and animals who don't understand what's going on. So we started what we call, my wife and I started the Bipolar Awakenings Healing Retreat in order to create the necessary environment. Our methodology was as follows. Uh, provided an initial psychoeducational phase, which largely involved my videos, but also some books by Gra. Uh, a questionnaire to better understand the nature of the experience so I could really understand what was going on. A series of Skype consultations beforehand to build a relationship. And then this intensive personalized retreat, okay? After that, the, the client would be accompanied with a post-retreat integration phase, usually involving a local therapist or us via Skype calls, whatever support we could give them. All right. Let's go. Uh, the logistics. We needed a safe location away from the city where the neighbors wouldn't be bothered by the noise. And each client needed to have a trusted supporter, somebody who was going to be with them through the whole thing. They were there before the retreat, during, and after, okay? And then this gives you an idea of what our ideal house was like. You know, we had a family member donate this house to us for 2015, and we had a few retreats there. Um, the perfect location, one day I hope to buy this place. A uh, very nice house out in uh, the Brazilian jungle, huge lot, lots of privacy. Uh, yeah, that's and connected with nature, obviously. So this is our ideal. Okay, so now once we're on this retreat, we've got this perfect space, we've got the set and setting. What are we doing? What are we doing to liberate the trauma? The first thing we're doing, and the most important aspect, is holotropic breath work. And this is a nice photo of you know, what our private breathwork sessions would often look like. You know, it's off of Google, but you've got the breather who's laying down under the blanket, and then you have a, a supporter or facilitator who's sitting there with her, obviously very still and paying close attention to what's going on. Now, what's holotropic breathwork? Well, created by Stan and Christina in the 1970s, Stan and Christina Groff. 
It's a, heal a technique for liberating trauma using voluntary over-breathing, a little bit like this. <sighs> Holotropic means moving in the direction of wholeness. And the client is invited during this process to express their inner experience without any sort of repression whatsoever. And that means that part of our role as being a facilitator is we're there to protect them from hurting themselves, from banging their hands against a wall or, or, hurt, or pressing their head against something. You know, that's what we're there to do. Okay, now this technique has a capacity to release physical tension, life trauma, perinatal trauma, trauma that can happen during the birth process, which is very important, uh, repressed emotions like sadness, anger, fear, joy, uh, sexual repression, uh, sometimes people get very sexual in their experiences, and even what we call spiritual energies of a divine or a demonic nature. Sometimes people feel like they're in ecstasy, and then other times people feel like they're being possessed. You know, that, that can happen. Now, how is this all happening? Well, Stan Groff refers to the intelligence which releases these blockages as the inner healer. So basically, you're going into this breathing process, you're playing powerful music, and then you're entering a non-ordinary state where this inner healer sort of takes over and begins this healing process of releasing trauma and other energies that need to be released. And as a result, a trained facilitator is needed to accompany this process. Don't try it at home. It's a dumb thing. One or two things will happen. Either nothing will happen or something that's going to just really scare you will happen. So it's best you need to be with a facilitator when you're doing this, okay? So what does the breathing do? Well, uh, the breathing, it's a little like being a surfer and you want to surf out in the ocean of the unconscious. So before you can actually start to surf, you need to swim. You need to swim, you need to get out to those waves. And then once the waves come, which is part of the breathing, because the breathing is the swimming, okay? So you get out there. Then once the waves come, you can really go back to your normal breathing or breathe however you want, and the focus becomes sort of surfing that wave of the unconscious, you know? Just going with it, expressing yourself as you wish to express. And it's a very irrational or irrational approach. It's not rational at all. And so sometimes it takes people a few sessions to sort of get used to the idea, get comfortable with, with, with what's happening, okay? Just the way it takes you some time to learn how to surf, right? All right. And what do you experience? Well, we, we talked about all those different possibilities already, but it's also, it's very unpredictable. You get what you need, not necessarily what you want. And I've had a few clients who at some point in their process became disappointed because they really had a fixed idea of what they were going to get out of this thing. And then what came to them was not what they were looking for at all, you know? So it takes a certain open mind and willingness to sort of work with what, with what comes up, you know? The initial breathwork sessions tend to be milder as participants get used to the technique, and that was for me too. And then once you get more and more practice with the technique, once you start to trust the inner healer a little bit more, then you can get to some really deep and powerful stuff. All right. So this is a good time to show a small video of a breathwork experience. And you'll see, you'll get a great idea of what's going on on the outside. You won't get very much of an idea of what's going on inside the person. Uh, but as you'll see, it, it can be quite a, a dramatic process for people who really haven't seen yeah, this sort of thing before. So, Ron, do you want to play the video?
Okay. Start my webcam again, I guess. Yep. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yep. Start sharing. No. Okay, you can hear me okay? All right. I don't see Ron's video. There he is. Okay. Okay. So, you know, uh, everybody's got their own first impressions, but I think it's pretty obvious that this is not your typical talk therapy session, right? This is not a typical hospital environment. The work is very deep, very emotionally powerful, and quite primal in, in, in what we're going for in, in this type of work. All right, so let's, let's continue with the presentation. Where are we going now? Okay, so this all sounds great, you know. Uh, great, we'll just do breath work and everything will, will fall into place, but uh, the majority of facilitators will not work with people d diagnosed with mental disorders because they feel that they don't have the safe setting and they're afraid of opening up a bigger psychological process that they're not prepared to support. And so generally it's contraindicated for breathwork facilitators to work with people with bipolar disorder. But, you know, because we have a retreat where the individual, um, because the retreat is individual, we're in a safe environment, the clients have our complete attention, you know, so we can do this there. And in this way, we breathe with a client almost every day of our retreat process and have only encountered minor problems. And you got to understand that when you do the Groff training modules, and I was certified in 2016, it's uh, eight training modules, okay? Uh, it's about a three-month process to get it all done, um, but it, usually it's done over the course of a few years. In my case, seven years. You know, when you do those modules, you breathe twice in a week, and that's it. And those breathwork processes are quite powerful, two, three-hour sessions. So imagine when I talk to the facilitators and tell them that I'm taking a group of people that are contraindicated for this work, and I'm breathing them in two or three-hour sessions every day of a 10-day retreat. You know, they just can't believe it. They're, they're completely floored that, that this is possible. And of course, their big fear is, you know, psychosis, and we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, other techniques, so we'll come back to the breath work a little bit, but um, other techniques right now that we're using, which have really started to take less of a role because the breath work has been so powerful in the retreats. Uh, Vipassana meditation, where we help people focus on the body, and because breath work involves focusing on the body as well, it's a, it's a good complement. It also brings a certain sacredness to the retreat process, which is important to have, right? Um, mandala drawing, which is mainly used to express the uh, experience in the holotropic breathwork process. If you go on a typical holotropic breathwork weekend, mandala drawing is part of that. And there you're starting to explore your psyche again. You're helping to integrate your, your experience and also share, okay? Share with other people what you went through. Okay, so those were our other two main techniques. And then our plan was, so we take these techniques and we adopt them for people with bipolar disorder. Part of them meant changing the name holotropic breathwork to bipolar breathwork in order to give us space for adaptation and innovation. All right, because holotropic breathwork is quite a formatted thing, sort of uh, trademarked by Groff Transpersonal Training. So I just felt it was better to just call it bipolar breathwork because we were innovating all the time. We wanted to give people an opportunity during the retreat to speak freely about any experiences that they may have had or were having. So along with the whole transpersonal aspect, there was part of it that was really much more like talk therapy, you know, just giving people a week long to just vent about whatever's going on. And uh, like I said, from psychiatry, we were working with people at their normal dose of psychiatric medication. And as part of our client agreement, what I ask people is not to change the level of medication they're on until three months after the work we do. You know, that's the recommendation. So they stay on it before and um, during. And I had to learn that from a few uh, experiences, but anyways, we'll talk about that later. Um, okay. Now here's some of the good stuff from, from this process. Some of the good stuff. Done 34 retreats since 2013 with 25 clients. We did them in various countries, the US, Mexico, Romania, Germany, Finland, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Brazil. 
Each retreat has been generally between seven and 12 days, although a few have been shorter. And Magdalena's first retreat was actually three weeks because I was afraid she might go into psychosis and she was my first client. So we we shortened that quite a bit. And seven clients have done more than one retreat, including Magdalena and Moni, who will be speaking soon. More of the good stuff. The clients with bipolar disorder have really responded well to this technique. Most of the time, they're able to go into this non-ordinary state in this safe setting within about five minutes. You know, it's a, it's a really, it, it get, comes to them quite quickly. Nobody has entered into psychosis, and that involves more than 200 breathwork sessions during the retreats. Some people have gone on to have manic episodes after the first retreat, but nobody has had episodes during our retreat, and that was very encouraging. Uh, psychiatric medications have not gotten in the way of our, of our, of our work. Um, it just isn't a concern at all. And when we first started with Magdalena, for example, um, I actually had her come off her medications before we started the retreat. You know, that was, that was where we began. But we've realized, oh, guess what? You know, the, the meds aren't getting in the way. We did have one client with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, who really didn't show any progress from this retreat program because OCD is really about taking firm control of your environment in a way that it's not quite the same with people who have bipolar disorder. That's some of the good stuff. More good stuff, I was certified. I started doing this work in 2013 because I'd already worked with people in psychosis. I'd had some experience with breath work, but I was certified in 2016 by Groff Transpersonal Training, and they're endorsing my work and have even referred at least one client to come and work with me. He didn't come but the referral was there. And some clients have felt so strongly about the potential of this work that they've joined us here to share their stories. All right. Um, and the first client I have here is Magdalena, who's from Romania. And Magdalena, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Magdalena would like her privacy because you, many people know her in Romania, so she won't be using her webcam, okay. but she does have um, a PowerPoint presentation to share with us. I just us. wanted to share so, a couple Magdalena, of Magdalena, go ahead, take it away. Uh, Basically, I uh, made them uh, the true story of bipolar, bipolar disorder conquer, <laughs> healed with uh, Sean Blackwell's retreat. Uh, this is me back in 2005, um, successfully working in, a, uh, in marketing as a brand manager in a multinational company. I used to be a, a competitive swimmer for nine years. And I used to love uh, skiing, skating, basketball, ping pong, tennis, swimming. And this is how I looked before everything started. And uh, this is me in 2011, after six years of being diagnosed as bipolar and receiving treatment, being hospitalized, uh, being hospitalized for uh, about uh, a month or even two months every year starting with uh, 2005 till 2011. I gained, I almost doubled in size. Uh, I lost three marketing jobs due to uh, yearly forced admissions into psychiatric hospitals and I ended up in unemployment. I had to move back with my parents since I could no longer afford to rent anything on my own. And due to med side effects, I became obese and was diagnosed with thyroid can cancer as well, having a 7.5 centimeter diameter nodule and the thyroid analysis completely blown out of the chart. It had to be 78 as a number and it was 490, okay, just to give you an idea. And was recommended surgery, thyroidectomy, and eventually post-surgery procedures like chemotherapy and everything. And uh, after giving it a little bit of thought, I refused. And thank God I did. Uh, what happened during uh, the period between 2011 and 2015? In 2011, I contacted Sean Blackwell. Between 2011 and 2012, I translated and subtitled all of his videos in Romanian. Uh, and I did two healing retreats with him, one in 2012 and one in 2013. During the first... Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so 2013, 2014. 
during and the Michael first Lena, week, I think, I think it was 13 or 14. Or bipolar breathwork, as he named it right now, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kundalini energy was released, and with it, my blockage on the root chakra was solved. Together with it was solved another thing. I used to have a cosmic pain, which I didn't mention in the, uh, in the presentation, that lasted three years. And in that first retreat, the pain associated with, with my cosmic was completely resolved during that holotropic breathwork session. Basically, at the end of it, I stood up, I sit up, and Sean was looking at me saying, well, are you going to sit on your ass as long as you are <laughs> already doing it without any pain? And that was, mo sorry for the, uh, for the word, that was the moment I realized the pain was completely gone. And imagine this, I wasn't able to sit up from a chair before that, uh, with using my leg, I had to push myself up with my hand. The pain was that excruciating. And I even uh, went to the doctor with it and I received a recommendation to have surgery at my cosmic, even though I had an MRI did before that and it was nothing physically wrong with my cosmic. And the question to the doctor was, well, what are you going to do with my cosmic? There's nothing physically wrong with it. I said, well, we don't know. We'll open you up and see what's in there. I said, no, 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 thank you. Okay, after the second retreat, I managed to make my own voice heard towards my brother and my father and was able to speak my truth since then. And uh, this led slowly towards the healing of my thyroid because the thyroid is connected with the um, chakra, connected to communication. And as soon as I started speaking out my truth or speaking whatever I thought uh, and whatever I felt, especially towards uh, the masculine side of my family, my brother and my father. Um, this helped me with the entire communication towards other people and uh, the nodules started shrinking and my thyroid analysis got back to, nor to normal in time. Uh, one year after the second retreat, Sure. Mm -hmm. Can I, Magdalena, can I just jump in for a second? Yeah, I, I just would like to say to, to our audience here that, you know, when we first met, you were such a huge fan of my work and we talked a lot on Skype, but I often felt that Magdalena was kind of almost acting like, I, I couldn't feel her emotionally in a lot of times, and it was it was a struggle sometimes to have a, a spontaneous conversation. And then after the work, and you can hear the conviction with which she tells her story now. You know, there's obviously nothing Thank nothing you, fake or false about you know the way she's uh, speaking. One year so after I just thought I'd throw that in there that I went you've really become a much more authentic communicator, just like you're saying. Started here. exercising again. Lost 24 kilograms. Go ahead and got back in shape and started my own business. And this is me now. I went to 74 kg, thyroid analysis got back to normal, thyroid nodule went down to 5 centimeters in, in diameter already. I'm off med completely for more than two and a half years with no signs of bipolar symptoms whatsoever. I'm owning a successful business and just starting a, new, a second one, living on my own for a year now, and spending most of my time traveling, doing sports, and meditating. And um, I guess that's a big thank you <laughs> to the guy that saved, literally saved my life, Sean Heron. You're most welcome. <laughs> well, thanks for speaking up. And I think one thing we didn't put in your presentation, but after, I think after both of your retreats, you did have manic episodes after those retreats, but that those manic episodes seemed to Absolutely. continue the healing process in some way. It was like you were releasing energies that needed to be reorganized, much in the spirit <laughs> of the old Soteria Clinic, right? The, the Soteria model. Yeah. 
Yeah, and this was very devastating for me when when uh, Olivia, sorry, Magdalena started to have, or she had an episode she, right after, two months after our first retreat. But then as we started to talk, we realized that the manias were actually serving the Remember, healing purpose again, Remember, like the original intention of the first episode, Psychosis. So episode, we've seen this with a few other clients as well, where it wasn't the end of the world. They just needed Remember, to continue I, the process. I, I was in the States with my brother. Yeah. And I was mentioning to you, I was feeling a lot of heat coming up uh, on my spine and affect, actually physically affecting right. my nose and mouth area. I, I basically, and I was giving you a, a, a metaphoric uh, example, like I was like um, somebody that was um, uh, sitting, out, sitting out fire through her mouth mm -hmm. and her nose. Mm -hmm. that, that was the feeling. Yeah, and I was using a lot of cream on this area because the skin was getting um, dried very, very badly. And I was using a lot of cream yeah, to, yeah. to keep it down. Yeah. And I was drinking cold water in order to, to cool down. Okay. And basically when we discussed, we, we realized it, all, it was also a Kundalini experience. Right, and I had read in a book by uh, a meditator from India in the 1930s, Gopi Krishna, who had, had, got, who had gone into a Kundalini awakening uh, experience, yeah. and he described his, he had energy coming up from his, his heart, and his <laughs> mouth was on fire, and he was continually trying to get more water yeah. to, to satisfy this burning <laughs> face, burning mouth. You're it was exactly the same cover, symptom son. again that Olivia had had. <laughs> And so it was another very well. Tangible that's all right. Connection. It's not a problem. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I keep using the wrong. <laughs> okay, Magdalena. <laughs> I'm going. You're most welcome, Sean. <laughs> Magdalena. Okay. All right. Well, listen, we gotta we gotta live. Uh, Magdalena, thank you <laughs> for your help. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I guess all because right. of our time and stuff. We should get to Moni as well and, and hear Moni's story, and then no. we can stop for questions yes, after Moni no. tells us. I don't have story. any slides okay. with me, but um, I just, All right. Uh, so, Moni, like do you want to take you. over? Um, before I met Sean, um, I had a mental breakdown in 2012. Um, I had had a lot of life stresses. Um, I had real problems in my marriage, it broke apart, and then I had a very bad hand injury. I'm a portrait artist, so I couldn't use my hand anymore to draw and all these things. And I had to move you know, from one city to my home city, and I had to do it all alone with two little children. I was separated from my husband. And so, yeah, this breakdown was uh, really, uh, I think, yeah, the, the flat to it, uh, I think. And um, so uh, I went, you know, I couldn't sleep anymore. All my traumas from childhood uh, came up uh, at once. And, um, you know, due to the lack of sleep, uh, I, I had hallucinations at night and all that. And it led me right to uh, the emergency room of the psychiatrist hospital. My sister supported me because, um, yeah, I was in a scary place at that time. And then um, I was put on medication and my whole hell of a journey started from there because uh, my body refused everything and um, I was on 28 different medications uh, within uh, a time span of nine months and I was in and out of hospital during that nine months because Two of the medications were life-threatening. I, I almost died twice, and um, all this led more and more to you know this rapid cycling of bipolar disorder that I was diagnosed with. And then after these nine months, and at the end of 2013, my my friend who had supported me uh, during my crisis had read about Sean's book. And uh, she recommended it to me. She said, maybe there's something more to, to learn about bipolar disorder than what the hospital says. Because they said, uh, well, 
you have to put up with lifelong medica uh, medication. And, and I was like, no way, you know, no, I will find a way to heal because you're not the one taking these meds and you don't know what it means, you know, to take this. And I, I could not just um, give in and um, I wanted to find a solution for myself to heal. And so when I read this book, you know, I was really excited because I could relate to many things that Sean was talking about and I saw there was a spiritual dimension to my disorder and not just what they said, chemical imbalance and trauma, blah, blah, blah. And um, then I um, went on and then explored um, Sean's work more and I went to his YouTube channel, I, I, I watched all the videos and I was so super excited and, and on his website he asked for someone to translate it into German and I was uh, willing to do that because I thought, wow, you know, the Germans have to know about this too and more people have learned to know about this because this gave me new hope, you know, because at that time I had no hope left because, you know, everybody said, well, you cannot do anything, you know, to change the situation. And so, yeah, after that I contacted Sean and told him, well, I'm translating your videos and then he suggested me a Skype call and from there my whole healing story began um, because um, he said, uh, it was in 2014 when we had that Skype call and he said he would come uh, to Europe later to work with Magdalena and, and he could offer me a retreat too if I wanted to do this. And I was excited because I thought, well, this is the, the thing I need. I, I felt it. It was just, you know, something my intuition told me, uh, this is the way to heal at least the possibility. And so, yeah, in, uh, in October 2014, I was still on five different medications. I did the retreat. It was a 10-day retreat. And it was a very, very intense experience, powerful healing experience. And uh, I released all of my childhood traumas, um, childhood abuse, um, sleeping problems, and all kinds of other problems, really severe traumas that had led to my, you know, difficulties of sleeping. Until 2014, I, um, I had fear of going into sleep. You know, I never had a good night, and and after that retreat, I could sleep. I, I I felt safe in my sleep, and this was a life changer in the first place. And from there, um, after the retreat, six weeks later, I could go off all of medication. I was free. It was Christmas Eve, and I was just like, yes, I've done it. You know, I I I made it, and. Um, yeah, and, and this experience and um, this experience was so powerful and so different from all of the other treatments I had before that, you know, um, that I wanted to support uh, Sean's work. And um, yeah, and, and the following years after, until now, I've been organizing his retreats in Europe and uh, supporting clients with him as a, as a sitter, you know, as a supporter, organizing everything and being there, you know, as an ex a peer. And so it's this exciting work and um, Sean and I have really figured out a lot of things. Um, and um, yeah, and, and from there I, I felt that um, I want to become a therapist myself. And um, so in 2016, I started two different kinds of uh, therapy classes. One is uh, a healing practitioner for psychotherapy. It's an overall license that I can be a therapist in Germany. And the other thing is Gestalt therapy, which is really a good combination with holotropic breathwork because it really goes well together. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. My life has changed. Um, one thing I want to talk about is that I did two more retreats with Sean the following years after, and I think they were really beneficial because um, after the first retreat, all my traumas were resolved, I could sleep again and all that, but in, within the next year, I had a lot of stresses coming up 
too, and I was getting a little bit more unstable, and I, I felt that more things came up, other things came up too, and and then the retreat resolved all these things, and I'm, this was very, very beneficial. And then the third retreat was just a short one, and um, there was still some stuff, you know, was still some stuff. Um, and this was good too. And now I really feel I will never be sick, sick again. It's, I'm, I have a very balanced um, emotional being and um, I, I know, you know, what to do, how to keep myself mentally health and, yeah, healthy. And so I really feel I'm ready now to support other people who are not so lucky yet. So, yeah. That's why I'm here and talking about my story. And just so people know, Moni is a regular participant in the retreat. She's helped people as a supporter. And I'm actually in the process of you know, sort of helping her get to a point where she could be a facilitator as well. And that's why she's doing her own deeper work now is I feel like Moni is out of that zone of being bipolar and she's gone into normal, that sort of normal zone. But to really be a benefit to people who are who have a disorder, you've really got to go deep into your own work. And right. so she's continuing yeah. that process. And uh, we've worked together four years in a row now, right? Like oh, yeah. Three retreats. And you helped me in the second and third year, and then last year, it, you were just helping me with the retreats. You know. so. Okay, so this was do my fourth you, question. Do we have time to show your video? Ron, what do you think? Dealt with my childhood yeah. traumas that I have Okay, with so we'll show the video. Was, uh, uh, this is a video that Moni did. Well, go ahead, Moni. You want to tell people session, a little bit? And after the session, I really felt bad for a few hours, and Sean stayed with me to support me until... And then I went to sleep, and then... After that, All right. it was gone, you know? Yeah, it was resolved. Yeah, the music came up. You, you said, uh, I, I had to stay up yeah, with Moni because I think we finished the session around 9. And, or or eight, and I had to stay up with you until three o'clock in the morning because you were afraid to go. The first thing I noticed was the huge pain from the tension again. Some of it was still Titanic related, but I sensed that there was more to it. I suddenly had a vision and found myself in a dark room. The color was a dark, muddy brown. And in the far, I saw a flickering red candle burning, providing the only light. I was lying on my back on a mattress, and I realized that I couldn't move a muscle. Everything seemed paralyzed. Suddenly, my father appeared on my left side, and my elder sister on my right. They both stared at me with satisfaction, and I became so frightened that I held my breath. I wanted to move and try to lift my arm, but my father held it down forcefully, and I shrieked in pain. He said he wanted me to lie still, but I didn't want to. He became enraged and pressed his hands against my throat. I began to cough and to gasp for air. The pressure was so high that I believed I would suffocate. I was terrified to death, but the worst pain was the realization that if I didn't obey his orders, he would kill me. I still remember that during the scene, I actually pulled my blanket around my neck to protect myself. Sean told me later that I had put real pressure on my throat, which had enhanced the sensation of being choked to death. When I surrendered to my father, he let go of me, enjoying my terror. My sister laughed with him. I tried to remain motionless and they kept staring at me with their hands on my body, but they didn't really do anything. The main act was their own malignant enjoyment of having power over me. I couldn't stand the situation. The panic was unbearable. I cried deeply for the bitter truth that had been buried within myself for all those years. The pain of being emotionally abused washed over me. I felt worthless and unwanted. They had abused my trust and loyalty, which had destroyed my self-love and esteem. It was the deepest pain during all my breathwork experiences, and it was even worse than being lost in abstract fear like the experience before. 
Suddenly the vision changed and I was in complete blackness. I saw a storm of radiating energy that raged inside my body. I felt strong vibrations within my cells which were hard to bear and there were zigzagging bolts of energy slashing through my whole body. A high tension made me shake violently and then a twist of strong hot energy was emerging from my inner organs rushing up which made me gasp. I was strongly controlled by the interplay of the energies so that I began to sweat and shiver at the same time. Sweat was running down my skin but I felt like ice inside. I couldn't ground myself as everything was moving and so I grabbed Sean's hand in order to stabilize myself. It took me a long while until the tension started to resolve. I was still under the impression of the whole experience and I felt very miserable and extremely exhausted. That night I didn't want to go to bed as the vision of my father and my sister in the dark was still strong. As a little child I used to have traumatic events at night which woke me up in horror and left me frozen to death. With that in mind, I stayed on the couch with the light on, trying to shake off the fearful visions. My supporters were very caring and stayed up with me until I felt I could sleep. Surprisingly, I slept fine and was back to my energetic self the next morning. I found it so amazing that I had overcome the deepest fear of my life in just a few hours. I'm back. <laughs> okay. Whew. Thank you. Thanks, Moni. And I, I guess I'll just add that, you know, Moni has a tremendous capacity for confronting her own fears and pain. She has a tremendous amount of courage. And uh, not all breathwork sessions go like that for, for people. Although all of Moni's sessions were like that. All of Moni's sessions were like a total nightmare. Sometimes I wondered what the hell I was doing. But often the clients we've had have had sessions that are quite quiet and they've needed to go through a, a process that's a little more gentle, a little gentler. Okay? Yeah. So, Ron, it's 1.34. I've got a little bit more of my presentation, but I thought now would be a good time to take a break and answer some questions because we've, we've heard from Magdalena, we've heard from Moni, and uh, the bigger part of the presentation is completed. Uh, what do you think? Ready to talk about some questions? Is that where you're yeah, saying? I think so. And then, then if we have time, we could go back to the presentation for an additional part, like near the end, you know. But we've been going an hour straight, so maybe it's a good time to take a break for questions. All right. So I see some people are wondering if, um, and I don't know if you guys are even aware of like internal family systems uh, work and, and how that works. Um, it um, has to do with trying to get the internal parts to work things out and the parts that have been exiled to be able to come back in. I don't know if you're familiar with that or thought about how that relates to the work you're doing. Well, I've had some experience with family constellation therapy. Okay. But my, my, my feeling at the same time is that the, the real non-ordinary state work is really the part that's missing in this whole equation. And so I, I sort of focus on that. And then when the family issues come up, I sort of defer to the, the psychologist or whoever people want to go to. Moni, you're studying gestalt therapy. Do you have any insight into the, the family dynamics you want to share? Um, well... No, not really. <laughs> um, it, it's it's not the same thing. Uh, family constellation is a really yeah. special thing, yeah. you know, that's, that's by itself. Yeah. And I don't know my, too much about it. Okay. So. That's something different than internal family system therapy because internal. It was a family therapist, Richard Schwartz, who worked with families, but then became aware there was something like an internal family, different parts of the person. So there might be parts that we're trying to manage everything by controlling and keeping the feelings uh, associated with the trauma away. And he called those the parts associated more with the stuff being tried to be kept away, exiles. And so a lot of what he was trying to do is get the parts that were more like managing everything to step back and let the exiles come forward and work out what they needed to work out. 
So in that sense, it seems to relate to some of what maybe is going on within your work. Yeah, I would say the one thing about you know a holotropic breathwork model that's different than any other form of psychology that I know of is there's almost there's no effort to guide the process from the therapist whatsoever. You have the person go into a non-ordinary state and you support whatever's going to come up, um, but very rarely is the experience guided into a particular part of your personality or the father in you or the mother in you. You know, we don't do any of that. But with that said, I mean, family issues are a huge part of, of what surfaces when people go into non owner states, you know. The, usually the first issues are related to family, you know. Well, yeah. That's, that's also what Gestalt says, and Gestalt therapy says, you know, that you know, it should come from a time where you de were dependent on your parents uh, to survive and that you had to adapt to, what, to their model of, you know, viewing life and things and what they gave you as the truth. And even if it was not yours, you know, you had to adapt it in order to re receive the safety, to, to receive love, you know, so, and this can be an issue later for you if you um, believe what you were told, even that it's not true for you, you know, so Gestalt therapy tries to uh, make you aware of what is really you and, you know, to separate these things, you know, that some things don't belong to your personality and you think they do, you know. So this is what Gestalt does. You know? So they go into some issues, but it's also they are just giving insight and, and some, some, you know, hints. It's like the person has to find their own inner healer wisdom. So um, Andrew is wondering, do you distinguish in some way between bipolar, psychosis, and schizophrenia? I have a, I, I spend a lot of time when I was making my videos, you know, um, because I have a lot of slideshow videos, and they really build in a sequence up until about 23 consecutive videos. And, you know, originally, we, we got this separation between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder from a psychiatrist over a century ago, uh, I think Bueller, Gustav Bueller, am I getting his name right there, Ron? Have you heard of this guy? I'm not sure I could say. I've heard of him, but I'm not sure if I know the pronunciation. <laughs> okay. Ferris Bueller. <laughs> um, and this guy, you know, came out over 100 years ago and said, look, we've got this sort of mental disorder, which is schizophrenia, and then we've got this emotional disorder, which is manic depression. All right? But um, I think that there's been greater and greater recognition uh, especially in the last 10 or 15 years, that there really is no dividing line. There's no separation where you can say, well, this is schizophrenia and this is bipolar. You know, you can't really separate out those things. And uh, one big shift that's happened over the last 20 years is that in the past, when someone had an acute psychosis, like I did, where you go into that dreamscape and you start to act out from that place, that always used to be diagnosed as schizophrenia. And now because they recognize that often these psychotic, psychotic states start with mania and then go into psychosis, they've seen the relationship in the sort of going from mania into psychosis. Most people today are labeled with bipolar disorder um, when they have acute psychosis. And that's called bipolar 1. And then manic depression is bipolar 2. So there really is no dividing line between those things. Uh, but some people have disorders that are much worse than others, and one big, um, and then of course, and then you've got this whole purely spiritual type of psychosis like I had, spiritual emergency. So I see them as all related. Uh, some disorders are deeper than others. Some are much more disturbing and less spiritual than others, but there's no real place to separate them out. And, and because of that, I see it all as the same thing, okay? But the nature of the experience can be much more difficult to work with. Um, how people are dealing with their experience can be very difficult or very different. So 
I'm looking for people that have a fair amount of maturity and insight into their condition because when people don't have that, they often lie to themselves about what's going on and they're, they're lying to themselves about their disorder and they don't have any insight into their own lies and they're lying to me. So a person with that sort of profile doesn't do very well in our retreat because they're really afraid to go in. So uh, if you watch video number 21 on the relationship between spiritual emergency and bipolar disorder, I also talk about schizophrenia as being a part of that spectrum. Okay. So Bill's wondering, do you know of any other uh, actual techniques besides holotropic breathwork that are being used to help um, someone through a non-ordinary state in the aftermath, um, like a, something like a psychotic episode? Okay, well, there's a few different techniques, um, breathing techniques in particular, that are sort of similar to holotropic breath work that different therapists use um, to take people into non ordinary states. Uh, rebirthing is one particular one, but as I mentioned, with rebirthing, the person is breathing, and, and there might even be music involved, but the, the therapist is guiding the person into the birth process. In holotropic breath work, there's no guiding of, of any kind. Um, but as far as I know, nobody's using any of these techniques for resolving mental disorders. And then, um, you know, the other technique that is similar to using breath work is to use psychedelics, or MDMA, or LSD. And Groff has a long history in using LSD uh, in therapy. And the only reason he created breath work was because his LSD experimentation became illegal. Okay. But in my opinion, you know, the psychedelics have a side to them, which I think can be quite dangerous. I think it can lead people into situations that they're really out of control, and then they can't come back. Whereas with breath work, you're sort of here and there at the same time. It's not a completely out of control experience. And, but most importantly, I think that, you know, we don't know the health implications of the psychedelics, and they're unnecessary. Because everybody that I've worked with that has bipolar disorder can go into a non ordinary state in the setting that I'm providing using holotropic breath work, bipolar breath work. So why would you want to use a, a technique where you don't know the implications, uh, as with psychedelics, when you've got one that is so incredibly safe and it's just breathing in a safe setting, you know, with a trained facilitator. That's what's needed. Um, I think that sometimes people get very disturbed by holotropic breath work because breath work has a lot of implications about what it means to be a normal human being. You know, that guess what? We're all traumatized. Guess what? We all have a spiritual dimension. You know, and, and, and these are things that are often not recognized by the man on the street or people with more of a materialist orientation. You know. They think that talking about everybody having a spiritual dimension is a religion. It's not a religious belief, it's a scientific assumption. You know? We're making that assumption and then if you use these techniques, guess what? You're going to discover that part of yourself if you're open to it. It's not, it's not a belief that's being imposed. Right. Okay. Okay. One question about the, the cost of this and are there any scholars, uh, maybe the cost is high, are there any scholarships? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm doing this privately, I, I can't take a scholarship. Um, the uh, cost right now, I'm, I'm charging 360 US dollars per day, which is about what, you know, there's a lot of psychologists, a typical California psychiatrist makes $400 an hour, you know. So I'm doing this on a shoestring. Uh, Moni has been volunteering her work, largely. And it's a challenge right now because we recognize that doing it, for example, a 10-day retreat, once you rent the house, once you've paid for food, it's going to be about $5,000, okay? Now, that is nothing compared to being in a private psychiatric hospital or even being in a nursing home where they do nothing for you, just feed you and take care of you. It's, it's cheap when you, when you compare it to that. But I recognize that for a lot of people who've lost their jobs, who, don't, who are living with their parents, that the work I'm doing is still, you know, expensive. And, and so we're, we're trying to find ways to make the work more efficient, more accessible for people. Um, and, yeah, and we're, we're even, we've even started experimenting with shorter retreats 
that are, are less of a um, emotional and financial investment. You know. Yeah. We're okay. working on it. Here's, here's a question for Magdalena. Um, <laughs> Describe to us how you were able to deal with your manic episodes after your retreats, because it sounded um, like you were. Um, sounds like it was more healing than disturbing. But anyway, could, could you just describe a little more about how you dealt with it? Sure. Well, one uh, one break before I, I actually enter to this. Uh, you have to understand, guys, that my retreat, my first retreat, retreat was also, let's say, the first retreat in this manner that Sean did. Am I right, Sean? Sure, you were the first one. I okay, that and uh, it happened. It happened 2013. Okay, so five years ago. Since then, a lot has changed in the healing program as far as, uh, as we can see from, from Sean's presentation. Okay, so having said that, you have to understand that uh, we tried the first retreat with me going off meds completely, which is not happening nowadays anymore. Okay, so bear this in mind. Um, well, after the first retreat, as Sean mentioned, I went into a uh, manic state. But I also uh, went from Romania to the States immediately after the retreat. And Sean actually uh, advised me not to do it because I was very sensitive after the retreat. And normally I should have had at least three to six months to six months to integrate everything that happened during the, the retreat. Okay, so all this being said, I kept on discussing with Sean on Skype, I think almost every day after I arrived in the States. Isn't that right, Sean? We, we talked a lot, yeah. We talked a lot. We talked a lot on Skype. So we had a lot of Skype sessions, and I actually talked with him about all the um, things I was going through. Okay. And the Kundalini experience that we mentioned before, that uh, my face got literally on fire, okay, that was something that we discussed about before the manic um, uh, state came up. Okay, so it was like a pre-manic phase uh, in which the healing continued. Okay, so it was actually a, a, a continuation of the retreat <laughs> while I was away in, in the States and Sean was already in Canada visiting his mm -hmm. parents. So I was visiting my brother, he was visiting his parents, but we kept on continuing with the Skype conversation. And, and this is how I managed the, the, uh, this state. But as he mentioned as well, it also led to a uh, psychiatric hospitalization. This is the reason why he was so disappointed. I didn't see it as a disappointment. Okay? It, it was a matter of controlling whatever could become let's say, dangerous for me. Okay, so, so the way I see it now is, um, okay, it got uh, uh, to a hospitalization there, but it was a safe environment, environment for me at that point. And um, also the pre-manic phase led to a lot of healing before I got hospitalized even. Okay. And also the, the hospital, uh, the, uh, host, the uh, admission to the psychiatric facility was a lot shorter than I used to have all the previous years before the retreat. Okay, because you remember I mentioned in the presentation I was hospitalized for one month or even two months at a time. And I even had, in one year I remember I was uh, uh, got out of the facility, of the psychiatric hospital, and then I had to be re admitted to the psychiatric hospital for another month. Okay, so my, my crisis all the time, but my manic crisis got worse and worse and worse with every year that, was, that I was hospitalized before the retreat. Now after the, the retreat, this hospitalization was shorter and I could get out a lot faster. Okay? Yeah, no, my... And then we did the second yeah. retreat. 
Please, Lisa. No, on, on my side, when Livia was talking to me, I was telling her, look, you're with your family. This is not, not a supportive environment for you. Go back on your medication. But because she was manic, she wasn't listening to me. Um, <laughs> Yes, that yeah, is true. <laughs> she wasn't listening to me. And then, and then eventually they, they hospitalized her. And then when, you know, the family, when she got back to Romania, it was told to me that, you know, the recovery was much faster. I didn't know that Livia had these just hurricane-like manic episodes. I mean, she had very strong episodes that would last a very long time. And, uh, yeah. and that was news to me. I, I didn't know that before we started working together. So... Sometimes ignorance is bliss. Now, because, Livia, you, you said it earlier, but you had had 10 straight, you were hospitalized more than 10 times, right, before we worked together. Yeah, yeah. you know, 10 hospitalizations, this is a pretty heavy-duty thing. This isn't just first break and, oh, we're going to work together. This is, talk about a woman with 10 no hospitalizations. Way, <laughs> but she's a powerhouse. Yeah. I mean, she is a powerhouse, and she wasn't taking no for an answer, so um, away we went. And then we have the second retreat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, and uh, that was the moment I was able to speak out. Okay. That was the moment I was able to have uh, long discussions with my dad and with my mom as well. And I was able to put out on the table everything that was kept under the rug until then. Okay, and it was a lot of healing happening together with my family because, okay, it's painful both for uh, me and both for my parents because they were not ready to hear all that stuff, definitely. But in the same time, I felt that uh, it was healing for me and for them as well because they were able to shift their paradigm, because their paradigm was this. Our daughter is mentally ill, and we have to hospitalize her, and we have to take care of her for the rest of our life. And uh, uh, God knows what is going to happen to her when we are going to be dead, okay? Because my parents is my dad is 75, and my mom is 70 years old, okay? They are not in their youth. So um, these, these talks, these family talks took, took place and we were able to heal our family uh, issues in those talks, even though they were painful in the beginning, in the end they were healing for all three of us. And I'm so thankful that we could do this talk while they were alive, you know, because I'm not left with the regret that I uh, you know, I'm the uh, mentally ill daughter, and they had a mentally ill child, and all that stuff, all that crap. Okay, everything was set out on the table, and our re family relations uh, got in place, back in place. Okay. So again, a big, big thank you to and Magdalena's father <laughs> for helping me out. Magdalena's with father. Magdalena's what? father is now my friend on Facebook. So that meant a lot. When I got a friend request from, from her father, I was like, wow, I guess she's doing great. Uh, yep. Okay. Another question? Yeah, there's a question about whether you recommend changes in nutrition as support for healing the body and soul and coming off the drugs. <laughs> Well, there's two parts of this. One is that I'm not exactly a great role model, okay? I love Domino's pizza. I'm probably going to have a Coke right after this call. So I am not the, the wellness guru, all right? Doesn't, doesn't, I, I try not to drink very much alcohol. I drink almost nothing. Um, I think that it's good to have, a, 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 obviously, a good diet and all that kind of thing. But I think that sometimes... It's a way that people can avoid doing what's really necessary. And for me, if you really want to deal with your disorder, start the inner healing work. Get after the trauma. Bring up your shit. You know, that's really, to me, that's where the power is. And, of course, I'm not against wellness. Everybody should be doing, having good diet, good exercise, and all that kind of thing. And it can be beneficial, especially in the integration side. But 
the roots are in that trauma. That's how I see it, and, and it's, it's about digging up those roots. Some people disagree with me, uh, but uh, that's just how I see it after the work I've done. Yeah. Right. So, Marty notes that you're one of the, the helpful revolutionaries in the field of mental health. How can these revolutions become installed as standard care in our mental health system? Well, uh, well, once once you find out, give me a call, okay? <laughs> you know, my my wife Leisha has done a lot of work. Um, she, she's been more working with people at an organizational level. So in Brazil, she's representing the International Spiritual Emergency Network. We've done conferences for Emerging Proud. Um, we've got a group in Brazil, Alma Bipolar, Bipolar Soul. So we're sort of getting people together in a grassroots level to do these things. And then we go out and we talk to the local psychiatrist. She just gave a presentation at a psychiatric hospital in Brazil. And when I go back to Brazil, I'm in Canada right now, but we have the intention of going back and talking to some um, psychiatric hospitals about what we could possibly do in a hospital setting. You know, we have one, one contact He's a transpersonal psychiatrist named Jimmy Ehrman, and he just happened to find himself in a very good situation in a hospital in St. Louis, and he was doing holotropic breath work with 20 psychiatric patients a week um, for 12 years. So he did 11,000 breathwork sessions with psychiatric patients, and he said it basically wasn't a problem. And they didn't have sitters, they didn't have all the structure involved. Um, and that it was, it was voted the favorite therapy of the psychiatric patients in the hospital. That's why they kept doing it. He only stopped doing it when he, he needed to move to San Francisco. So it was like a, you know, a regular part of that hospital work, and it went very well. So his advice to me, because I met him at a conference in Greece, his advice to me was just take this technique and run with it, because it's a lot safer than most people give it credit for. I can see where it's going to be important at some point to have more like uh, training people how to do this kind of work. So not just doing the retreats, but training yeah, people how sure. to do the retreats. You know, and Moni is uh, the first student in my training program. <laughs> and honestly, Moni has done so much. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. You want to say? Yeah, so that's why I'm I'm doing my uh, therapist uh, education now because I have my own concept of you know how I see how I can help people heal, and uh, which would include breath work. So I'm doing now in April my first official JTT uh, model uh, module uh, for psychosis and spiritual emergency in Prague near Prague and um, I intend to do you know my certification there too and then with the Gestalt I have a good you know package I think um, to you know work in my own practice with these techniques later you know when, once I'm certified and I think this is a powerful com combination which could help and now with my um, experience with uh, Sean's clients and the retreats with me there's such powerful you know, a ch powerful chance of, you know, really healing, you know, things that cannot be healed in other ways, I think, you know. And, and after Moni's experience on her retreat, you know, when I went to my certification in, in, in Spain, you know, you're talking about a group of people who have all been through all the Groff transpersonal training modules to get to their certification. And I have more confidence in Moni being the supporter and facilitator of someone with bipolar disorder than I do with probably half of the people that I got certified with because she's just done a lot more inner work and she's fearless about the whole thing. So I think she's going to be a fantastic therapist. You know? And the holotropic space is my yeah. element. <laughs> I, really, I really feel safe and comfortable there because it, it reaches into you know, your own organismic wisdom or inner healer, you know, this kind of thing. And I think there's a lot, you know, more potential to heal than in ordinary states, you know, where the ego blocks everything. Yeah, it's kind of like our favorite restaurant. It's, we just love to go there. It's like, yeah, let's get holotropic, you know. <laughs> just lay down, start breathing, woo, off you go, you know. It's great. <laughs> yeah. All right. 
Somebody's asking if this work bears any similarities to EMDR, eye movement, um, desensitization, and reprocessing. Well, that's an interesting question because I was doing a retreat in North Carolina and uh, I got in contact with a therapist there and we decided to trade experiences and he was an EMDR guy and he came and he did a breathwork session with me and then I did EMDR with him on a particular issue. And my feeling, at least working with this particular therapist, was that, you know, you were accessing that non-ordinary state. You're, you're going to that dream state in EMDR as well, where you're sort of communicating what's coming up inside of you. And so I, I found the underlying principles of EMDR quite uh, uh, conducive or similar to what I was dealing with. I, I like the technique a lot. His technique, or the EMDR technique, is really about specific issues. You know, you got one particular issue in your life that you want to deal with, and it seems like EMDR is better for that. Uh, whereas breath work is more like working on the whole you and very little intellectualization uh, and, and absolutely no analysis on the part of the facilitators. We believe that the most important truth is coming from the client, you know. So there's very little guiding of any sort when you're facilitating. Okay. I think they could be compatible. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I think we've kind of like run through the questions and and kind of run through our time. I know there's really people have made a lot of comments thanking you guys doing your presentation and people really appreciated it. Um, so I'm hoping the recording is going to I come through clearly, and I'll be I'll email it out to everybody so you can um, review it again if you want, or share it with someone else. Um, any any right. conclusions, remarks? Yeah. Well, just there's one comment here from Betty Ann Pierce talking about the medical industry being about money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and you know, she's quite you know cynical about that whole thing. And you know, I've you know, hey, it's the medical industry, especially in the United States, it's really monetized and everything, and, and that's all true. But at the same time, you know, we didn't, we didn't get cars because people were complaining about the horse and buggy. You know, like, somebody had to go out and invent a car, you know, and now we're complaining about cars, we're inventing drones or electric cars, or we're we're coming up with different ways of dealing with it. And I think that there's a lot of focus online about what's wrong with psychiatry. There's a lot wrong with psychiatry. But, you know, there's not that much focus out there on creating new models. The, the most common model I see out there is the Soteria model, which is a good, I mean, it's a good start, but it, it just doesn't work for what I want to do. And I think that it can be quite, I, I just don't see the Soteria model growing as a really viable replacement to psychiatry. It's, it's just got too many little quirks to it, um, like, I, like I mentioned. And so, I mean, it's going to have its little place here and there, but it's not going to, I just don't see it taking off. And uh, we're looking for ways to move forward that are really going to replace psychiatry so that, you know, when psychiatry goes down, it's because the consumers, people, are choosing other options. You know, psychiatrists are going broke because nobody goes to the psychiatrist. You know, <laughs> that's that's my vision. Yeah, Don. Somebody was wondering how they can contact you. Uh, through my website, on my email, contact on my email, uh, bipolarawakenings.com. I can type that in here. Awakenings.com. BipolarWakenings.com. You can get in touch with me through email. I do Skype consultations with people, charge $100 for an hour, and if it's for a retreat, then the second call is followed up with a questionnaire and evaluation, and the second call is free. Okay. okay. Any other concluding remarks by anybody? We're still innovating. We had a I, I just felt like we shared a lot of information, and uh, you know, thank you, Magdalena and Moni, for sharing your stories. I think it's enough for today. 
there's parts of the store we haven't even got to yet that are really amazing, but uh, I think that we, it's a great place to stop, and I just want to thank everybody for their participation and uh, focus. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. So I'll leave the chat open a little bit if anybody has anything to, to say, um, but I'll end the, the meeting, and thanks so much for this great presentation. I really appreciate it.